end and do our best, the two of us up here, to summarize everything that we've heard over the past two days, which is impossible. So we're going to try and come up with sort of 10 big topics. We do have some slides. Hopefully you have those there and can bring those up. There we go. Our top 10 takeaways from VMED 23. Um, we're obviously going to miss some things. And it'll be interesting to hear what your takeaways are. Um, this conversation will continue long after this, this presentation. And can't wait to hear from you guys moving forward. As an aside, every year we open up applications for presentations for the next year. Um, and so typically around June or so, and we'll make an announcement when we put up the application. We got a ton of applications this year. It's always very difficult to pick sort of the best program and find themes, and I'm sure it'll be even harder next year. But if you guys are interested in speaking in next year's conference, uh, go ahead and put in an application. Let us know what you want to talk about and uh, what next year's takeaways should look like. So let's get started with the first takeaway. Uh, oh, who is the clicker? I realize I don't have a clicker. Oh, there it is, okay. It's like, I just have to imagine it virtually. Okay, um, all right, I'm gonna start with this one and then we're gonna kind of go back and forth and sort of chat with whatever comes into our mind. But this is a big overarching takeaway for me. And I think about where we were in 2018 when we first did this conference and compare it to now. And in fact, the presentation that we just heard would not have occurred in 2018. There would not have been a detailed step-by-step -step procedural on how to go through the regulated pathway for VR interventions. But we have that now. And that's part of a larger story that has clearly evolved and is coming through to me in this meeting, is that MXR is now a legitimate science. It is a legitimate branch of medicine. Did I hear a clap back there? Okay, let's try that. <laughs> that's right. That's because of all of you guys that it's become a legitimate branch of medicine. The FDA is involved. We have regulation now for the regulated pathway. We have NIH-funded research in the U.S., federally-funded research all around the world. Right? We have a growing library of programs available. Uh, we have a new medical association, the American Medical Extended Reality Association. I don't know if Mark is here or not. Is he in here? Well, either way, if he's not, I want to thank him for his, his uh, vision. And if you, uh, again, want to sign up, there's a special he pointed out yesterday. You can sign up. Um, and all of this means that this is not some fringe science anymore. And so I sometimes will hear people say, well, it sounds very experimental. And it's getting, fr it's getting exhausting. It's, it's not experimental anymore. Like I said yesterday, we have meta-analyses upon meta-analyses now. And Skip Rezzo pointed the same out earlier today. Uh, yeah, well, there's always more work to do. There's always more we have to figure out. And that's why we have these conferences. But that's the case for every branch of medicine. This is a legitimate science now. I think it's time to talk about it in that manner, both in these rooms and outside of these rooms. You agree? Absolutely. And um, one other thing. If you look at the chart of time versus how many publications, showing virtual reality is an effective treatment for any condition that you can think of. That is just grown exponentially year over year. Uh, at this point, anyone who's been following the literature cannot possibly have a doubt that virtual reality and other MXR technologies are effective for um, you know, many different conditions. So um, this is not where we were in 2018, but this is where we are today, and that trend is just gonna continue growing. Absolutely. All right, um, you wanna take this one? Uh, yeah, so um, we know that we need help from places like Meta and Apple to take these technologies to the masses. I get the question a lot of why are these technologies not widespread? And there are many reasons why, but the biggest reason is that we don't have a good platform for where we can disseminate them. If you were looking at the booths, every company has their own device. And this is really just insane because we can't expect people to be buying, you know, $1,000 devices for every single thing that they want to use it for. It would be like uh, uh, having, having to buy a new iPhone every time you want to download an app. It's not sustainable. Uh, companies need to take this seriously and allow us to disseminate medical uh, apps on their app stores. And uh, 
right now, for example, Meta has a policy that medical apps go to the app lab. And as I say, the app lab is where apps go to die. So <laughs> that is not a good place for them. We need a place for medical apps so that patients and clinicians can have a library that they can choose from and easily download it without having to spend thousands of dollars on devices. I also think there's a business case to be made here. When I think about many of my patients who do not own a VR headset, are not interested in playing first person shooter games, they don't even know what VR is, but if a clinician were to say, listen, you don't even need to you know, prescribe it, like there's an app that could help your well-being, um, and here's how you get to it, but you need a VR headset, there's a decent chance they'll go out and buy a VR headset not to play games. They may end up finding those games and enjoy them, but they went out to buy this headset because there's some therapeutic value to them in their lives. And so I think that's a really important message that um, companies should come to think about and recognize that there's probably a business case. There's an untapped well of people who would very seriously consider buying a headset if they knew that it can help them in this manner. So I think this is an important takeaway. Uh, it's come up in different sessions in different ways, and I wanted to sort of bring this to the fore as we think about uh, a blueprint for the next year and beyond. Now, uh, I want to put this one, I'll read this one. Understanding the mechanisms of VR, including its impact on the brain and on the immune system, can help optimize its therapeutic potential and guide future development. So I'll say a few words, and I definitely want to hear from Omer, because he spoke in the session this morning. Anyone attend that session this morning? For, I thought, yeah, this was, a, I thought, an excellent presentation. Because it really demonstrates that we're moving to the next level now in this science. We understand the phenomenology. We understand what happens when people use VR and the emotional experiences, and we can measure the psychometrics of this, how much pain are you in, what are anxiety scores like, lots of things that we can measure. But it's still a bit of a mystery what's happening in the brain itself, what's happening in those connections between the nervous system and the immune system, what's happening in the body, what are the psychological mechanisms? And this is important because we can then have targets to measure, biomarkers to measure. And we can also start thinking more about the mechanisms of action. Just like pharmacologists think about the MOA, or the mechanisms of action of drugs. Uh, I don't, you know, if I gave the same drug to every patient, I'd be a really bad doctor. I need to think about what is the condition that I'm treating, what is the underlying pathophysiology of that condition, and what is the right mechanism of action of this whole pharmacy that I have, what's the right pill to pull off the shelf to give the... Same thing with VR. VR is a therapy. We need a VR pharmacy. We need a VRX. And as a doctor, I need to pull, pull the right treatment off the shelf for this patient based upon its mechanism of action and what I think it's going to be doing for that individual patient. And then we start getting to the point of targeted precision immersion. And so this was a very useful set of presentations. If you didn't hear those, we'll be posting videos later. Go back and watch them. I think they were fascinating. And uh, give us a blueprint for where research needs to go and where this field can go over the next five to 10 years. What are your thoughts? You spoke in that session. Well, yeah, I, I said what I had to say about that. Uh, uh, of course, we need to create uh, uh, custom tailored applications for the um, disease that we're targeting. And to do, be able to do that, we have to understand the mechanism of action. Why are we employing different things in our apps? How do we design the app from the ground up to target what we're trying to target. And we can do that, just like if you're in a, the pharmaceutical business, you can develop a drug and just hope that it works. You have to understand something about the mechanism that you're trying to address. So if you haven't uh, seen my talk, yeah, you can, it's gonna be online, you can go back, and uh, I spend a lot of time on that point. Go ahead. So takeaway number four, patient-centered uh, MXR will ensure that treatment is tailored and specific. Right, so we need to move towards um, being able to customize apps so that they are targeting uh, what patients need, uh, need specifically. As a virtualist in a hospital, for example, uh, you can't just uh, uh, give the same virtual reality experience to everyone and think that it's gonna work. You have to have ways to customize the experience for that particular patient. Uh, so this is, um, I think this is very important and where the field is going to take us to. Uh, I don't believe that apps can be just generalizable for everyone. We really need to think about the, the patients themselves. And this goes to uh, 
another reason why when we develop apps, we have to develop it with as many patients as we can to get diverse opinions, uh, diverse cultures, and take that feedback very seriously and implement that back into the app. Yeah, a great example is the presentation from New Zealand. Very specific use. I can't see if our speaker's here, but uh, using, oh, there he is, for, for Maori woman. Uh, you know, uh, childbearing, labor delivery. That's a very specific use of virtual reality, regionally specific, culturally tailored. And, you know, that's why I wanted to have that international corner, by the way, to hear how different um, parts of the world are approaching their own people, their own populations, their own cultures, and starting to adapt this VR treatment for all sorts of different applications. And often I like to say that VR, you know, people ask like, oh, does VR work? Does VR really work? Like, that, what does that even mean? That's like asking me, does medicine work? Does medicine, like no one asks that, does medicine work for people? Like what medicine are you talking about? For which patients? What is the application? Like, VR is a, is, a, is a platform, like a syringe. It's not the syringe that matters, it's the medicine that goes through the syringe that matters. It's what are people seeing, hearing, feeling, experiencing, and is it aligning with their knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, preferences, cultural experiences, you know, that's what we mean by tailoring the experience so it's specific into, into the individual. And there are many other examples from this, this program um, that I think highlight that. Yeah, and this really is, I guess, a continuation of what I was just saying. Um, global applications of MXR showcase its potential to impact healthcare across different cultures and settings. And I guess I kind of uh, stepped on myself with the last one, but we don't need to say a whole lot more, but what else would you like to add to this? Um, yeah, first, uh, that XR session um, uh, about the uh, global use of VR was really fascinating to see how people from New Zealand, Australia, uh, Netherlands, how they use VR. It's remarkable because it turns out that every culture kind of responds to this technology. It's not just us in the United States. This is a global phenomenon. And I just think it, in, in terms of numbers, how many patients can benefit if these technologies are widespread? And when, when people in New Zealand can benefit from it, and Australia, and, and, and Europe, and everywhere in between. Uh, this, is, this has huge potential, and I think that we can help over a billion people if we can just get this technology right. Yeah, I'd say that uh, we're not at all ahead in the United States. I think we're behind. Um, I was fortunate to visit Harry and, and many of his colleagues in the Netherlands last year, and I was, um, I mean, just amazed at how advanced they are, how many examples of virtual reality they have in the hospital. They have, a, you, know, in, uh, you know, in one hospital, there was a whole clinic, essentially a whole room set up with uh, just for virtual reality. They have actual patients that come in and out all the time. You know, here, uh, that's not always the case. We're, you know, we have to look for philanthropy to support these things or trying to find whose budget it will come out of and, you know, who's really the champion to do. Yeah, you know, it's not so straightforward uh, in the United States, but I could say in the Netherlands, I was amazed at what I was seeing. They're doing incredible work. And I'm sure in many other nations, too, you guys have stories to tell. And I think as we go into the future and uh, future conferences, um, I'm hearing an interest in in how do you guys do that, whatever that is? How did you set up that clinic? Uh, who paid for it exactly? Um, you know, where did the money come from? Where did the patients come from? I think we need to do a little more of these kind of workshops and you know, panel discussions from around the world of what worked and what didn't to just implement this stuff. Uh, so that's another thought that I have and we can only um, gain from learning from each other's global experiences. MXR is clearly revolutionizing surgical training uh, and medical education, um, allowing for more immersive, realistic, and effective learning experiences. Uh, so many examples, and now when I think of MXR broadly, by the way, I think about, you know, I tend to be focused on the therapeutic opportunities, uh, you know, the benefits for patients in terms of measurable clinical outcomes. Then there's a whole, uh, you know, educational side and a whole simulation side, and all three of those clearly overlap like Venn diagram, like a Venn diagram. Um, but the examples from Justin Barad, for example, he's been doing this work longer than most, and so many others in the hall out there uh, are demonstrating how we can supercharge learning, especially when it comes to procedural interventions. Um, the, you know, I, I'm a proceduralist myself, um, and uh, I do procedures all the time. Uh, they're hardwired in my brain, kind of like riding a bike, but it took, you know, thousands of repeti repetitions to get to the point where I am now. And even now, 
Uh, I don't do it as much as my colleagues do because I'm busy, you know, running conferences like this. And so I have to kind of sometimes remember what it is that I'm supposed to be doing. And when things get really complicated in there, sometimes I have to kind of like, oh, it's a little bit of a, a you know, anal sphincter moment, let's say. <laughs> um, uh, so, and I'm not ashamed, by the way, to say, I don't think I'm the right guy for this. Like, I, like can we call in that guy in this room because I'm having some trouble here, right? So if I were able to practice over and over year-round in virtual reality, I, I might have an easier time in those situations, even if I'm not in the actual operating room doing these procedures. So this is really important stuff uh, for our field, for procedural fields, whether it's gastroenterology, cardiology, surgery. Um, you know, we, we say see one, do one, teach one in medicine. Um, but the sooner we see it and the sooner we do it, the faster we can teach it. So I think this is a really important opportunity. Yeah, let me say that I'm a psychiatrist, so I don't do any procedures. <laughs> Talk but, therapy. <laughs> but uh, since all the presentations and the demos, I kind of wish maybe I, I, I was. I want to, uh, they were so cool. Uh, there's augmented reality, virtual reality. Uh, I, it, it's such a no-brainer that these technologies can help educate, and they're much better than what's available today. So every medical school should really be implementing this right away because uh, these are mature technologies at this point. Totally agree. And there are examples, Cleveland Clinic and others, uh, but I think we can do a lot more. Um, we have a medical student in the room. Kate, have you done any VR in any of your training? Yeah, good to know. So UCLA. All right, uh, takeaway number seven. Yeah, I mean, this is a big, big theme of this conference. Uh, we had a special session on this. Interdisciplinary insights can help shape the future of MXR. You wanna start off on this one? Yeah, I think it's important that we all work together. We saw an architect, uh, David Beach, who gave a wonderful presentation uh, about how we can use space for, uh, as a therapeutic tool. It's not something that us as uh, VR developers we naturally know or think about. So being able to communicate and meet people uh, from many different disciplines in conferences like this is just invaluable. And I hope that everyone has been able to network because uh, if, if we only spoke to other doctors, we would be missing a whole other side of the field that can be used to heal patients. Yeah, it takes a certain openness to be willing to break out of your own framework, your own mindset. And I think people that come to a conference like this are naturally open-minded. Because although this is not a fringe science, it's still an early science. And so the people that fly out and come to a place like this and stay to the very end are passionate and excited about this opportunity and are eager to tell other people about it um, so that we can spread the news. But the people in this room come from such different backgrounds. I mean, we had talks about, uh, about process philosophy yesterday, about architecture. You know, we had, uh, we had a producer, uh, um, we had an Emmy Award winner yesterday, uh, this is Terry in here, I'm not sure. Um, the producer Moulin Rouge. Right, we have people from entertainment. Uh, I met a puppeteer yesterday. Uh, I don't know if puppeteer is here with us, but next year we might have to have a marionette show. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing to see the different backgrounds that people come from. And it is kind of natural that we're in Hollywood, to be honest. This is a very, very creative city. It's a, a sort of an inborn, um, I suppose, uh, advantage that we have because, you know, we have musicians that come to us and producers, and that's kind of a neat thing. But that's just the spirit of what I think MXR is turning into is we have to all learn from one another. Okay, we're getting there. We're almost there. Um, MXR... Uh, is clearly breaking down barriers to mental health care. We've had a lot of discussions about that. Who better than Omer to talk about what do we mean by, by this? Yeah, so mental health care, uh, as pretty much everyone knows, is kind of broken in this country, and I imagine in other places as well. There aren't enough therapists or psychiatrists. They take cash only, uh, many of them, because insurance companies don't compensate them enough for their work. And people in underserved areas uh, cannot access mental health professionals. This is somewhere. This is something that virtual reality can directly address by opening the door for people to be able to get therapy uh, that 
um, um, so that they don't actually have to go to, to a therapist's office. And that could be either um, uh, by speaking with a real therapist in virtual reality, but just far, you know, far away if you're in a rural area, or uh, getting uh, mental health treatments for depression, anxiety, PTSD, and otherwise, uh, just at home with a virtual reality headset without having to go to a therapist. I'm not saying that we can replace all therapists today, but for most people, uh, they can access a therapist. So having um, something that can help uh, versus nothing is a huge advantage. I'd also say that mental health care is health care. I'm not even sure it needs to be considered mental health care. That's a, um, I was talking to Ken Bai earlier, this is a holdover from Rene Descartes, like literally this 1644 maybe. I forget exactly when he wrote his treatise uh, on dualism, that the mind and the body are separate and distinct. We have this physical body that ports around this immaterial soul of a mind. And then over time, in you know, the history of our biomedical revolution was focused kind of on the physical body, and then the psychiatrist kind of took care of that stuff up there, and then the other kind of real doctors took care of everything else. And it turns out that's totally wrong um, and insulting to uh, mental health experts. Uh, it's all one continuous system, right? This stuff down here, literally your bones and tendons and, and organs and nerves and immunes, that is your brain, okay? It is. It's just the part of your brain that's not locked up in your skull, okay? It's all interconnected. We literally can't have thoughts um, without a body, like without having bones. I mean, like it's almost that literal. So what that means is, yes, we're focusing on the brain in terms of where the uh, direct immediate effect is when somebody looks at and hears sound and sees things, uh, but don't think it like ends right here. It, it, that whole thing is talking back and forth, up and down, microbiomes in the middle, you got serotonin, all, it's crazy what's going on in there. And we hardly understand it, but we're starting to get there. Mental health care is health care. We, every single chronic medical illness affects the brain and the brain affects that illness. And that's the way we need to be thinking about this. I think, Kate, you're snapping. Is that a good? Good. All right. So that's, that's number eight. Um, every specialty of medicine is starting to see the value of MXR. So it's, this is the first year I think we're starting to see more specialists coming in. So we had, uh, I, I happened to be a homer with gastroenterology. It was so gratifying to see some of the world's experts in my field, like Brian Lacey from the Mayo Clinic. You say, yeah, I'll come out to a VR, con like come out to a VR conference in LA, and I mean, he's a dyed-in-the-wool kind of translational scientist at Mayo who all of a sudden says, oh, wait a second, uh, I can see how VR could help my patients, uh, and now he's doing it at the Mayo Clinic and using it for people with chronic abdominal pain and dyspepsia. Uh, Linda Nguyen from Stanford also has been seeing the value, and every single specialty, you know, when, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Like, they see the value of this hammer, I guess, the VR, because they see the problems around them, and they recognize the limitations of, of our biomedical model. They recognize that what we've done is necessary, but not always sufficient to take care of the world's pro toughest problems. You know, we can try to, you know, fix the body, remove the lesion, surgeon here. We can try to open up the blood vessel, take out the tumor, but then, like people still have issues because we didn't, it's not so reductionistic that we can just remove something and uh, then people get better. Every single kind of doctor and clinician understands that's true. And then that's why I think mental health is healthcare. It ends up being, everyone ends up reverting back to, oh my God, what's going on this patient? patient you know, the most common con consults that we get in the hospital are from the pain service because they get paid to put needles in things and they put the needle in the thing and then they walk away and they get paid and they go, oh my God, it didn't, it didn't work. Patient, what do we do now? What do we, oh my God, what do we do now? Better call the VR service. Okay, so everyone's like, what do we do now? Better call the VR service. It's starting to kind of converge upon VR being just a very reproducible, concrete way to deliver standardized mental health services. So anyway, go uh, ahead, what do you think? Yeah, I don't know how many specialties we had here in this conference, but it's a lot. Yes. And I can't even think of another technology that so many different fields find fascinating and possibly helpful for their field. Uh, virtual reality is really unique in that uh, aspect, uh, from training to education, to burnout, to uh, patient care. There are just so many aspects to it that uh, it's just remarkable. Well, I'm gonna end with where I began. 
our sort of grand challenge here because the energy in this room, the energy over the last two days with 380 registrants, the excitement that I see is really a positive thing. And it's metaphorically upward looking. We want to look up and we don't want to look down. Okay? We get like gravity works on us from the moment we're born to the day we die. We get pulled down to the ground and we're back into the ground, like metaphorically and literally. Okay, We survive and thrive by standing upright and fighting the force of gravity. And this is not just, this is a literal thing, like a, like a physics thing, but it's also, of course, uh, a uh, metaphorical concept. We look up at the stars. We talked about that yesterday. I'm going to get choked up again. It's stupid. I already got choked up yesterday. I'm not going to do it again. All right. So I, I got choked up yesterday because I was giving you stories from our patients and how moving it was when they talked about looking up. <sighs> okay. You can say, ah, oh, I'm, I'm going to stop crying. Then. And it was, it was, it's, it's sad. It's sad, but it's so inspiring, and it's the hope that I talked about. And I really do think that's what we're here for. So bail me out of this. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you think? I, I, I think you dropped the mic on that one. Yeah, I don't know I if I can follow. I've been dropping the mic. I, it's getting old now. Okay, it was it was it was fresh yesterday. Now I just now I'm just tired. I think. <laughs> what are your uh, thoughts about this grand challenge, honestly? Uh, yeah, well, we are trying to improve mental health because mental health has. Um, uh, uh, has really taken a hit, especially after the pandemic, the divisiveness in our society, and everything else that's going on. And anyone who's working in the hospital can see not just the mental effects of that, but the physical effects that patients are coming in with. And we need new solutions. And here we have a new solution right in front of us. And I, you know, we really need to take advantage of it. It's, we can't just continue doing research after research after research. We need to start using this for the embetterment of, like I said, a billion patients. So we need to go out and make that happen. And we can't just, uh, you know, we, uh, the people in the room alone can make it happen. We have to pull people in and we have to reach out and spread the message. And I hope you all join us in doing that. Well, thank you all again. I've composed myself now for being here, <laughs> for joining us at this event for contributing, and we hope to see all of you next year. We'll announce dates soon. Tell your friends, tell your family. Come on back next year. Thank you all for coming. Take care. Thank you.